The belief in pokongs has been around for centuries, and people still believe in them to this day. They truly think the spirits of the dead remain lurking about until the proper rituals have been done to allow them to rest. Welcome back to the channel or welcome to the channel. My name is Yuchikas if you are new. And yeah, without wasting any time, let's get to the video. The Kachina Prophecy In Hopi mythology, the blue star Kachina is a spirit that will supposedly signify the coming of the beginning of the new world. It will appear in the sky as a bright blue star and will be the ninth and final sign before the apocalypse. The Kachina prophecy is almost like the prophecy of the end of days we see in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. The Hopi Native Americans lived mostly in the southwestern United States prior to the invasion of America by the Europeans. These days, there are an estimated 19,000 Hopi left in the country, living primarily in Arizona on the Hopi Reservation. They have an extraordinary belief system, and even though the Hopi may have changed a lot over the past few hundred years, their original legends live on. Frank Waters, who studied Hopi legends extensively, reported many of his findings in the mid-1900s. The Hopi believed in a great creator named Taiwa. It was said that at the beginning of time, nine universes were created, two for the gods and seven for the other forms of life. The first of the three worlds have already been inhabited and destroyed because they grew wicked and corrupt. Each time one of the worlds is destroyed, the few faithful Hopi are saved and then placed in the next world to try again. The Hopi allegedly believe that we are currently living in the fourth world and that it's only a matter of time before it too is destroyed by humanity's own darkness. This destruction will be heralded by the blue star Kachina. It will appear in the sky as a bright blue star, and the day of purification will begin. Number 9 It's uh, crazy how uh, there are so many beliefs uh, out there in the world, uh, apart from uh, like the major religions. Sheep and Trees For centuries, people believed that lambs grew on trees. In the Jewish Talmud, written in 436 AD, there is mention of a plant-like animal in the form of a lamb. From this stem was grown a living and breathing baby sheep, just like a gourd attached to a long stalk growing out of the dirt. These creatures supposedly grew in the land of Tartary, where Turkey is today. In 1887, Henry Lee put together all the insane historical accounts of the lamb plant into a book and published it. The vegetable lamb supposedly sprouted from melon-like seeds and would form a biologically living animal, complete with flesh, blood, and bones. People believed the stem acted as the umbilical cord and that it kept the lamb hovering just a few inches above the ground. The stem was bendable, so the lamb could move around and eat whatever plants were nearby. However, once it ran out of nearby plants, it would slowly shrivel and die. It could be plucked from its stem and cooked, and its blood allegedly tasted like honey. People in Europe used to believe the vegetable lamb of Tartary was a delicacy, but it most likely never existed at all. In reality, the legend started with rumors of the cotton plant, which Northern Europeans never would have seen before. They thought the cotton plant was an actual sheep growing from the ground. Number 8 Yeah, I see people uh, believing in that. Uh, uh, the world back then wasn't like uh, ours today and information uh, could take uh, years just to get to certain places and uh, yeah, I could see them believing that and uh, yeah, the misinformation was uh, widespread all over the place because people couldn't like uh, travel that fast and uh, there were no like um, and taking letters and uh, all of that was only for like the only a few rich ones and um, uh, information used to like spread uh, using word of mouth from uh, travelers and the like. So a uh, lot of uh, weird beliefs came from that. Weighing the soul. In 1907, Dr. Duncan McDougall of Massachusetts tried to do something unprecedented. He performed a series of experiments meant to physically weigh the human soul. Duncan believed that the human soul had mass and that it could physically be studied using traditional methods. This was not an entirely new idea, since people have always believed in spirits. 
Some believe spirits occupied a particular place within the body, and it only makes sense that the human soul should be a real and tangible thing. Duncan put together a special bed fitted with beam scales. Then he convinced terminally ill people to lie down on the bed as they died. Duncan recorded the time of death, changes in weight, losses of bodily fluid and sweat, and even loss of gas. Throughout all his experimenting, he learned that the human soul weighs approximately 21 grams. This was such a big deal in the early 1900s that the New York Times did a story on it. However, it wasn't a very nice story, and Dr. Duncan was utterly ripped apart by other scientists who denounced him as a fraud. To this day, nobody's ever been able to figure out if the human soul really does have any weight to it. Number 7. Blasphemous Forks the fork is the newest conventional utensil, and it was only in the 19th century that it was brought to dinner tables all over the United States. Up until that point, the fork was seen as something of pure evil. People believed the fork was both blasphemous, a slight against God, and effeminate, not something to be used by men. It's impossible to say exactly where the first fork was invented. However, it seems to first appear in the 11th century in the Byzantine Empire. A gold fork with only two prongs was used by a Byzantine princess named Maria Argyropolina, and while this may have seemed like a logical move, it was instantly bashed by Catholic society. Sarah Coffin, an expert in ancient history, says the fork was not associated with Christian values because it didn't seem like something that was essential to life. The princess who started using the fork supposedly died from the plague as divine punishment. This is a legend, and we don't know how much of it is historically accurate. What we do know is that in the 11th century, forks were frowned upon as hedonistic. Europeans ate strictly with their fingers and knives and slurped soup from communal bowls. Anyone who used a fork may as well have openly worshipped the devil. It wasn't until the 16th century that the fork became commonplace in Europe. It was popular in Italy because they needed it to eat pasta and spaghetti. The fork was modified multiple times. Number 6 yeah, a fork was um, considered uh, blasphemous. Yeah, yeah, the old world uh, or uh, the world back then uh, in uh, the road history was uh, very uh, weird, and a lot of uh, and there were a lot of weird beliefs everywhere. So um, yeah, I could see them thinking that a fork was uh, for the devil. So yeah, it's just uh, it's just just funny. Aliens in Ancient Greece Greek philosophers began speculating about life beyond Earth in the 4th century BC. One of the first real believers in extraterrestrials was a man named Anaximander, who lived between 610 and 546 BC. His groundbreaking proposition was that the Earth was hanging in an infinite void, held up by absolutely nothing, and hovering in the vast emptiness of space. He was a lot closer to the truth than he realized, and instinctively understood more about the universe than scientists would for thousands of years. As Greek philosophers talked more about the possibilities of what lurked out in the universe, they began to discuss extraterrestrial beings. The philosopher Metrodorus of Lampascus believed our world was one of many. He said the chance of a single world with life on it was the same as finding a single ear of wheat growing in a vast plain. In other words, he believed it was highly unlikely that ours was the only world out there. Even the Roman poet Lucretius wrote that there must be other planets occupied by other tribes of men and other breeds of beasts. As we can see, it was about 2,500 years ago that the belief in extraterrestrial life really took off. Even as we learn more about our universe, we keep asking ourselves the same questions. And now for number 5, but first I want to give a big shout out to Bubbles Activated and Tyronel. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos about history and amazing discoveries. Number 5 yeah so um like if you're religious um you could say that uh, your creator uh, uh, could have made uh, more worlds uh, apart from this one so yeah i do believe uh, like the universe is pretty vast 
Yeah, and we might even uh, never know like if you are the only ones here. So yeah, it's just uh, something that to think about if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But I mean, it could be the case. Yeah, you, you never know. So um, yeah, uh, maybe we'll find out. Maybe we won't. But uh, yeah, even though you, you just go on living like uh, everyone else, because I. Uh, nothing you can do you can't prove it you can't disprove it so just uh that's uh, just something to think about and i uh, imagine roman superstitions the ancient romans believed in a lot of strange superstitions and were responsible for many traditions that are still practiced today for example it was in ancient rome when the tradition of the groom carrying his new bride over the threshold of their home was invented Romans believed that if a new bride tripped as she entered the house for the first time, the spirits would grow furious and the marriage would be doomed. These were domestic spirits called penates that could ruin lives and so to prevent angering the spirits, husbands began carrying their brides inside so that they wouldn't trip. It's a practice that survived all the way until now. One of the weirder things the Romans did was try to see into the future by watching birds and it was called augury. Special priests called augurs would watch birds to see what they did and then would predict divine future events from that. Romans believed that the behavior of birds was a direct reflection of the god's will. The future could be determined by carefully watching what birds were up to. This was such a firm belief that there were whole priesthoods dedicated to watching birds. Whenever a Roman leader was going to do something important, the first step was to seek the help of an augur. The augur could supposedly tell the future based on what the local birds had been doing at the time. Number four. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Roman was uh, Rome, or ancient Rome was uh, responsible for a lot of beliefs today. So um, yeah, they could have uh, like uh, actually believed in. Uh, uh, but uh, for telling the future or uh, could have been some ploy of some uh, con man uh, back in those days but uh, it's interesting to see how uh, beliefs or uh, uh, beliefs uh, or uh, superstitions uh, uh, developed uh, back in those days so it's just uh, interesting the origin of fairies the belief in fairies started a long time ago and was very different from what it is today in the neolithic period which ended only 4400 years ago in western europe ancestor worship was extremely common the celtic and germanic tribes would typically bury the human remains of their revered ancestors tribal leaders chieftains heroes and great warriors in large mounds of earth some scholars believe that most European deities began as simple campfire stories of brave men during the Neolithic times. Then, as the years went on and the stories were retold and reshaped, these heroes turned into deities, gods, and legends. At some point, the bodies buried inside of these mounds were largely forgotten. People knew there was something buried, but so many centuries had gone by that their identity was lost. And so stories started being told of the spirit of the mounds, known as elves and fairies. Fairies were not winged beings with magic wands, but rather the spirits of the unknown dead. In ancient times, there was no real difference between ghosts, fairies, or elves. These these were all just different words used to describe spirits of dead relatives living in a kind of shadow realm and people used to believe that the fairy world existed just underneath the fabric of our own realm number three mount etna in the 5th century BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Empedocles of Akragas. He believed, like many ancient Greeks, that Mount Etna was the home of the gods. This mountain is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, and it's been spitting up lava and smoke for at least 2.5 million years. Throughout the centuries, Mount Etna has been at the center of a lot of Greek beliefs. It was supposedly the home of the fire-breathing monster called Typhon, who was trapped underneath the mountain by Zeus himself. It was also supposed to be home to Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the gods. The Romans called him Vulcan and worshipped him as the ultimate master metal worker. Nobody is really sure why, but at some point Empedocles of Akragas went a little bit insane. 
he believed himself to be a god, or at least endowed with the powers of a god. To prove his godliness to his jealous colleagues, he climbed to the top of Mount Etna and jumped inside. Suffice to say, Empedocles was never seen again. Number 2 And that was just um, insane. Uh, how we thought uh, jumping into a volcano could solve anything. But uh, yeah, cases like those I think were very common. Um, uh, and um, yeah, uh, mental illness, uh, illnesses was not, uh, were, could not uh, be studied or understood uh, back then. So I see a lot of uh, uh, things like that happening. Pokong. Pokongs are supernatural beings of Indonesia that are believed to be the spirits of the dead. Traditional belief says that the soul of a dead person stays on earth inside their body for 40 days after their death. When someone dies in Indonesia, they must be wrapped in a burial shroud known as a kind coffin. During the next 40 days, the ghostly spirit of the dead is then contained within the shroud. However, if the shroud is not untied at the appropriate time, the spirit becomes restless and desperate to escape. Only when the shroud has been untied can the spirit flee the earthly realm forever. The belief in Pokongs has been around for centuries, and people still believe in them to this day. They truly think the spirits of the dead remain lurking about until the proper rituals have been done to allow them to rest. Some of these spirits get lost, and some are even said to form colonies. There are urban legends in rural Indonesia about entire colonies of spirits that hang out in banana trees, and nobody knows why. Number 1. The Stork the belief in storks as bringers of babies came about over 600 years ago in medieval times. Storks have likely been associated with birth and fertility as far back as ancient Egypt, although back then it was believed the world was born by a magical heron. It was in the medieval days in Europe that the belief in storks bringing physical babies took shape. During pagan times in Germany and Norway, many couples got married during the annual summer solstice. Summer was the perfect time to get married, so that was typically when babies would start baking in the proverbial oven. Nine months later, in the midst of spring, most of these babies would be born. Coincidentally, storks had a very similar schedule. In the summer, storks began their annual migration. They flew from Europe to Africa and then returned exactly nine months later. This is why people began associating the return of the storks with the baby boom of spring. Rachel Warren Chad, who helped write a book on the subject, says the story then grew in complexity. The stork in Norse mythology became a symbol for family values and purity, and as the world became more Christianized and certain subjects became taboo, the storks continued to serve a purpose. Religious parents told their children that the storks delivered babies to avoid having to talk about the real biological creation of life. This spawned entire generations who believed storks delivered babies by some stroke of magic. Thanks for watching. How much do you think your soul weighs? Let me know in the comments below. And yeah, so um, never knew that uh, that was where it came from, and um, that's interesting to know. Yeah, those were just a few of uh, weird, uh, unique uh, beliefs back uh, there, back in history. So, um, yeah, very interesting. If you want to see more, tell me in the comment section. And, uh, yeah, thank you for watching. And as always, see you amazing people in the next video. Okay.